Hi, I'm Dr. Kachoyan, a literary manager of Australian Plays. And this is our first in a series of interviews with Nimrod Theatre Luminaries. We're talking today to Ron Blair, uh, author of several really amazing plays, including The Christian Brothers, uh, about his experience at Nimrod during that time. Ron, thanks for talking to us today. Great pleasure. Um, would you like to just quickly introduce us to how you ended up being a, a playwright? How, how did you end up encountering Nimrod? And well, at, uh, the university years are very important years for all of us uh, at the Nimrod because we all knew each other then. And I'm talking about... Um, I, well, I, I first went to Sydney University in 1960, mm. but people like John Bell and Ken Haller uh, and Richard Werrett had been there really since the late 50s. Um, I was born in 42, so this year I'm, uh, I'm 76 in a few weeks' time. And John is older by a, a couple of years, I think, and Ken Haller, if he was, if he was alive today, would be 80. Mm. Richard Ware died betimes. Um, so it was a very busy time at Sydney University with everyone involved in review. There were two drama societies, there were also two film societies. Uh, there was a couple of music clubs, including a jazz one. So it was very, it was mainly because you didn't have to pass quickly. It was a, <laughs> you could uh, repeat and it was much more at ease in those years. Um, uh, so there was time to do things, you know, you could, and there were two drama societies. One was called SUDS, mm. the old Sydney University yeah, Dramatic okay. Society, and the other was called <laughs> Sydney University Players. And they came about because naturally, well, after the Second World War, uh, the people who were in SUDS seemed to hang on too long, according to the new students who came in. So they formed a sort of breakaway players. And then by the time I got there, SUDS was doing um, the first Pinter in this country, was performed by SUDS. Uh, they did the first Beckett I saw uh, in Sydney. I, I don't know about Melbourne, but uh, I think uh, Barry Humphreys and Peter O'Shaughnessy might have uh, done the first Beckett in Melbourne. Uh, but at Sydney University there were two groups and they were very competitive. Mm. Um, they were driven by very talented, intelligent people who were obsessed. Uh, and we used to use the Wallace Theatre, which is not a theatre at all, it was a lecture theatre, but it was adapted to the stage. It had no backstage. It had. But I took, uh, I took lectures there behind the curtain as Dr. Bramstead uh, talked about European history in front of the curtain uh, to a history class that I was meant to be a part of. So uh, we did a lot of plays then. Uh, and then, as you may know, all that group went to England, which uh, was then the place where people automatically went to be trained mm. uh, because there was no NIDA or no VCA. Um, and so... And did you write any plays during that? No, I wrote a lot of reviews. For The review was very important. It was a big money raise. It was also very powerful as much as if you wrote comedy and you had 600 people laughing, you sort of knew it was a success. Mm. Uh, and uh, that, was, that was very heartening uh, if, you had, if you wrote some funny sketches. And I wrote sketches by myself, but also with Mungo McCallum. And uh, we wrote a lot of review material. Uh, and put it on, and so after that, people scattered. Mm. In the in the mid to late sixties, people scattered. Did you consider going to to the UK? Well, I of course I would have liked to, but um, I, I was too free with my money in in hotels. <laughs> I whenever I got a a dollar on Friday night, I went down and met friends in, in the pub at the Newcastle Hotel or the Fourth and Clyde over at Balmain. Or, I was, I was too intent on having fun here, whereas people who are seriously uh, going overseas, they worked and saved mm. and they, they got over there uh, and scrimped while they were there often too. But I worked here in advertising after I left university and uh, I worked as a copywriter in, in several places. And then um, I uh, exchanged letters with John from time to time and one letter he wrote me, he said he'd like to start a theatre. He'd been at Stratford, how he really wanted to do something Australian. Mm. The thing is that 
Finally, you, if you live in England all that time, you live, in a way, someone else's life. Mm -hmm. You don't live, a, I believe, your, a, the authentic life unless you're driven by war or famine or something to go somewhere. And that's a very good reason to, to leave. But if you have a, a working society, it's, it's a good thing to be able to reflect mm -hmm. where you grew up and, and where uh, the sort of society that you belong to. So John wanted to come back and do that. And I'd mentioned it to Ken Haller. I used to see him socially. And uh, he said, could he see the letter? So I gave him the letter. The last I saw it, of course. Uh, that was Ken. But the, uh, the seed was planted. And so when John came back, uh, uh, Ken, I, I think, may have met him at the... At the uh, he came back to work for... Uh, for NIDA, as a teacher for NIDA, and John Clark employed him. So the game was afoot. We were going to do something about it. And Ken was the guy who did something about it in, in physical terms of finding a theatre. Uh, and uh, that was the, the first Nimrod theatre in Nimrod Street, Darlinghurst, uh, a little theatre of uh, under 100 seats. Uh, but to put something on to reflect. And the interesting thing was, the we finally, when the theatre was done, um, the first, I talked to John about it, uh, I said, What's, what play is he going to put on? He said, well, I don't, we don't have anything. <laughs> and uh, I knew he wasn't going to put on uh, you know, old chestnuts. Or, you know, he's going to do something. Mm. He certainly wanted to do the classics. And, and he wanted to, he said, I just don't have any plays. So it, it occurred to me that not only occurred to me, I wanted to be a playwright at that stage and I'd bought um, a, a book uh, called The Memoirs of James Hardy Vaux, or Vaux as the English would have pronounced it, V-A-U-X, who was a chap who'd come out to Australia twice as a convict. He'd been deported, uh, or uh, yeah, twice. <laughs> uh, he came out here twice and uh, I think Maybe the first time was for life. <laughs> I've forgotten the details now, but I read this book and thought, what a wonderful story. So I told John about it, and he said, well, see what you can do. And I had seen at NIDA the Beggar's Opera. Aubrey Mellor had done a good, very good production of the Beggar's Opera at NIDA, and I thought, what a terrific uh, thing if one could do the Beggar's Opera uh, set, set in Australia and uh, with, an Australian, with sort of Australian themes. Yeah. Although, of course, they weren't Australian, they were all uh, Cockneys or uh, uh, Irish yeah. or Scots or whatever who came here. Um, and uh, that's really how it began. I, I began to do scenes. John and Anne were living, they just arrived back, they were living in an apartment block in Randwick, one of those uh, rather ugly red brick blocks that uh, were knocked up in the 60s. They had just arrived back. John was teaching at NIDA. Um, Already they'd had a success with The Legend of King O'Malley and that, that was very instrumental. The success of O'Malley gave uh, John the impetus when we got going with the, the Nimrod Theatre to, to do something else. You yeah. know? Uh, and everyone felt it was high time. The, the old tote had kind of run its course. It was, a kind of a, it was a wonderful in its time. In 1960 or 61 or so I saw uh, lots of plays, um, classics, mm. uh, and it was thrilling. Uh, new plays too. Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf was mm. done there. Uh, and so was your sense that, that if someone didn't do something about it, there was, there was never going to be a, a, a space for Australian Well, writing? it was true. The, the thing was that we had a very um, energetic art scene, uh, and we had a whole tradition of Australian painting. Mm. That, that was a hundred years old. And uh, I, my father used to take me down to the Art Gallery of New South Wales every year for the Archibald, uh, for, for good or ill. And uh, one was aware of this tradition. Mm. And in advertising, I was working for a, a small advertising company in North Sydney. And uh, in the art department, a guy called Tony McGillick worked who was a painter and uh, he was starting up 
a gallery in town called Central Street Gallery uh, where new, pa new paintings could be uh, shown and bought and uh, he used to, uh, in a sort of good-natured way, jeer at me uh, <laughs> because he, he reckoned we all just talked, we didn't do anything. Uh, and indeed, there's a lot of talk. We all knew each other. Viv Fraser, the architect for the wharf, uh, we all knew each other and mm. dined at each other's places and drank a lot and uh, did all, you know, just talked and skited. Mm. And, and he always used to say, why don't you actually do something? <laughs> so that was a, a good, good stick to beat us with. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so when the Nimrod began, uh, with the, the wind behind John after the success of O'Malley, we were looking, he was looking too, for new plays. And this kind of blurted out of me, really. Yeah, right. it, uh, and the, the, the music for it, uh, I didn't know anyone who wrote music, but the, by then John was, uh, had, made a, uh, um, had met Charles Coleman who was, I think, founded the song company. Right. And he said to Charlie, well, you know, can you write some songs? And Charlie, I, I just began to write the, the words. Mm. Uh, he wrote some original music. Uh, I found some uh, old colonial songs and um, s sea shanties and yeah. stuff like that to fit in. Uh, and I wrote new words. Uh, then Charlie got sick and got Terence Clark who'd been a, an actor in, mm. in the UK when he was, he also went through Sydney University and the Drama Society. And uh, Ch uh, Terence had worked at the Canterbury Rep uh, as an actor and he was also a musician and at that stage he was a maths teacher at Cranbrook. <laughs> um, so Charlie got him in because I think maybe Charles had taught music at Cranbrook, I'm not sure, but that's just you know, it's just connections. You can see how it can happen. So it seems a relatively informal uh, compared to what we might think of as a playwriting development process these days. Process? Like no Carl such Turing. thing. The word process was never heard. And, um, and is, is that your first full length, what, what yeah. you would call your first yes, full length? Yes, yes. Before that, I'd worked with, uh, because after the success of King O'Malley, which was written by um, uh, Bob Ellis oh, yeah. and uh, Michael Boddy, uh, Michael Boddy taught out at NIDA when John was teaching there too. Now Boddy had a great talent, an extraordinary talent that you could hardly pin down because it was, uh, it was a sort of magic really. He could, um, he could uh, do things on stage, just gestures or uh, routines that were, if he described them to you, you would say, oh, will that work? It was magic. Uh, he did that with, we got this thing together called Biggles and it was about the schoolboy hero, English Englishman Biggles and his team. Uh, I don't know if you know of Biggles. No, I don't know. No, well, Biggles was a schoolboy hero of our generation and um, lots of books. Captain W.E. Johns was the, the author of Biggles yeah. and uh, Bigglesworth was his uh, full name and he and his mates I can't quite remember their name, but they called each other Old Trout or Old Sausage. They were Englishmen and they, the books I think developed out of the First World War. Their first planes they had were Sop with Camels. And Body loved all, Michael Body loved all that stuff about the planes and, and the technology associated with the First World War aeroplane business. And Beagles went right through and fought in the Second World War and uh, there are lots and lots of books about Biggles and uh, p people read them compulsively through the 50s at school and people swapped them. Uh, they were, yeah. you know, uh, and uh, so the whole idea was, imagine Biggles and his friends, Algie and Bertie, all very upper class poms, uh, coming out here to do a tour of the leagues clubs <laughs> and how would they be received? Uh, and that was the, the skeleton on which this very slender piece of nothing <laughs> was constructed with a few songs. And uh, Body was in it. Uh, his wife, Janet Dawson, a painter, uh, did the set, painted the set and did the poster. And it was, 
because of Body's great ability to conjure stuff out of nothing, uh, it was such fun, you know. Yeah. And uh, I wanted to. John said, do, do, "Would you like to do some scenes?" I said, "I'd love to be involved." And so I, I gave scenes to Michael, but I made sure that John had the same scenes as well. And so John said to Michael Body, "What do you think?" Oh, he said, no, "Well, look, look, I don't think we need those." And John said, oh, "Well, I quite like them." Oh well, well, okay, so we'll put them in. <laughs> No, Michael never, never fought over these things. He said, "All right." For him, the theatre was, you know, whatever's at hand. Mm. Uh, he was, he'd gone to Cambridge, Michael Body, and uh, indeed he'd been a, a friend of uh, Ted Hughes. And when Ted Hughes was going through all that stuff with Sylvia Plath, and wanted a, a floor to lie down on before he'd married Sylvia Plath, when the, when the whole affair was knew that was all very fiery. I think he used to sleep on Michael Body's floor. <laughs> anyway, that's me as it may. So after that, um, we did Hamlet on Ice. Yeah. Michael had, uh, had been in the musical. He was an extraordinary man. He had many, many, many gifts, many talents. Sometimes I wondered if his chief interest in, in writing plays was something to do between uh, one meal and another, because he was a huge man. He was quite vast, but Marcel Marceau said to him, you are like a balloon, light and large. And that made it a lot easier for Michael to be as big as he was, because people used to say, how much do you weigh? You know? um, and uh, so with, um, with Hamlet on Ice, it was decided that it would be a kind of panto. Mm. Uh, and then it very quickly happened in discussion. You know, yeah. we'll, we'll have Hamlet as a girl and we'll have um, Horatio desperately in love with Hamlet. It was a piece of nonsense, mm. actually, a piece of nonsense. And, uh, but we did scenes there. In Biggles, Ken Haller played a small part. He played a, but the actors had just come out of NIDA, Peter Rowley and, uh, uh, you know, they just all come out of NIDA and to play, which and John had just taught them. So there was a feeling of making it up as we went. Mm. Uh, not important was the interesting thing. No one was making an important statement. We were entertaining an audience mm. that was um, wanting some fun. And it uh, seemed like an audience, a loyal audience, coalesced pretty rapidly. Right? Very fast. You couldn't get in. And Lillian Haller, Ken's wife, uh, became the sort of stacker. She would come in and make sure that people moved up <laughs> because every, every inch was a few bucks. So would you mind moving along, please? Move along. There's, there's room there. Move along, please. So she would pack, stack people yeah. in. This is before the council got wind of it or the fire regulations or any of that. Mm -hmm. So everyone was in this fire trap. Uh, Back to the gunnels. Yeah. And you, you're still working as a copywriter at oh, no, no. this time? Or you've... Oh, at oh, yeah, that time. Yeah, at that time, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, no, by that time I was, I was uh, working at the ABC. 1967, I joined the ABC as a script reader in the radio drama department. So I read plays, oh, yeah, which was <laughs> bliss, actually. It was bliss. I left the advertising business and um, went in a big cut in pay, mm. but it didn't matter. I was happy. And I read lots of plays, uh, and they were put, some were put on radio. And I stayed there uh, for 10 years mm. um, in the radio drama department uh, down in William Street. And, just, uh, uh, and did that have an effect on your own writing as well? Well, I read a lot, I suppose. I, I must have. I, I, a lot of the plays we put on were, writ, were, were writ, bought by the BBC and we would, get, we would get the scripts that the BBC put on. We couldn't have sourced all that stuff mm. here. So I used to go through the Radio Times magazine, which was sent out every week from London, uh, to, uh, to mark, uh, mark the copy and then I'd ask, we'd ask for the plays. And our agent in London, our, our representative in London, would get on to whoever it was at the BBC and they'd parcel up all these plays and send them to us. It was good for the BBC because that was an extra market for their writers. Mm. And if they could do that with Canada and South Africa and New Zealand, then the English writers 
who did adaptations, uh, got extra money. So mm. it was, I, I first read the plays of Brian Friel's there. Um, uh, and I thought, wow, this guy's terrific. Uh, some plays have never been done here. Um, uh, the Loves of Cass Maguire was one of his early ones. Philadelphia Here I Come has been done here. Uh, Crystal and Fox, I don't think I've ever seen it done here. Very early one. Uh, terrific play. Yeah. Terrific. But all those I read because they'd been adapted for radio by the BBC. Right. Uh, and we bought them and put them on here. And not only Sydney, they were done sometimes. Sydney and Melbourne used to divide the production time and the other states which were called the BAF states, Brisbane, it's a sort of pejorative term, alas, but Brisbane, Adelaide, Perth, Hobart were called the BAF states. And uh, they would be allowed to do productions, generally uh, midweek productions, uh, to, to, uh, to give their actors some employment. Mm. Uh, but, uh, and so there seems to be this sort of sense of uh, less hierarchy than we might imagine from a sort of English rep style, you know, that, that Nimrod was, everyone mucked in and everyone... Oh, yes. You know. Well, the, the pram factory in Melbourne uh, was even more, uh, less, or shall I say, less hierarchy. Yeah. So there you had to go and clean the toilets, yep. apparently. But uh, the pram factory did have a great influence on us. In fact, when I was at the ABC, I would hitch a ride down to Melbourne. Uh, I couldn't afford to fly. Um, I'd, walk, I'd get the train out to Liverpool on a Friday night, stand on the side of the road and uh, wait till the VW came. Generally it was a school teacher in the, driving the VW. All the Jags went by and didn't stop. Uh, and uh, sometimes these VWs, you'd get in them and they'd break down. You'd have to help the guy push it for a couple of miles, you know. But I'd get to Melbourne at two in the morning and I'd stay on someone's floor there and I'd go to the pram factory to uh, but because I'd left work I had a suit and I'd go into the pram factory and ask for a, a ticket and they'd see this guy with a suit uh, that wasn't their style at all <laughs> and uh, they'd say that sorry the house full no seats and I knew that was lies they just didn't want me in there because I was some bloke no with a suit <laughs> That's right. and so uh, I said oh well I'll wait if you don't mind I'll wait so the woman behind the counter, bolshy and didn't want to sell a ticket to a man with a suit. Uh, finally at eight o'clock, well, my money was as good as anyone else's, so yes, I went in. And the playing at the Pram Factory was exhilarating. Mm. Graham Blundell, uh, John Cummings, uh, this, uh, just Evelyn Crape, I mean, really thrilling performance. That was called the, the Australian Performance Group and they performed. Barry Oakley's plays there. I had such a good time. Yeah. And they were, it was... And so there was a conversation definitely between all those... Yes, between there was a bit of, a bit of uh, agreeable uh, competition. Mm. For example, the interesting thing was though, that David's removalist was put on down there. He was, I think he might have been in it. And it it just was put on and nothing much happened. Mm. It was when the Nimrod put it on, I don't know if it had better actors or whether the time was ripe, it was just one of those things. It was like uh, l putting a flare to a bomb, you know. It, it was an extraordinary success mm. and David was able to follow it with one success after another and people were anxious to commission him. John Clark commissioned him for Don's party, etc. So those that was, again, the great success of the Nimrod. It, it just managed to do a play that worked at the right time. Whereas mm. uh, it, uh, Don's party could have, uh, um, the removalists could have just disappeared altogether if uh, Nimrod hadn't taken it up. Mm. Um, and it was a, one of the most thrilling evenings in the theatre with uh, an actor called Martin Harris uh, playing... Uh, the bloke who was beaten up by the coppers. Right. Uh, extraordinary performance. And of course, he was, with that theatre over there, he was as far away from me as you are from me now. And it was uh, so extraordinary. Yeah. Also, you had a couple of other writers come back. Peter Kanar came back from England. He'd had a success in his child, when he was a young man, almost childhood, I was going to say child, when he was a young man, with a play called Slaughter and St. Teresa's Day. Yeah. 
That was uh, quite a su successful play. And uh, he came back, but I said to him, Peter, what did you write when you were in England? He said, oh, I wrote Sub Terry Rattigan. And that's, a, 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 that's the problem with a writer. If you take the writer, you can take an actor perhaps out of his or her milieu, mm. but a playwright carries the child, his or her childhood um, and experiences inside himself or herself. Mm. And that's the capital you draw on. Yeah. Uh, and it's very hard to put that in another culture. You know, Gogol succeeded uh, in Russia, not in Paris. Yeah. Uh, Bulgakov had a terrible time surviving in Russia, but uh, he did, he did yeah. he, just. Do you think those early works, it, it seems like at least some of your early works were responding to cultural edifices and, you know, that were responses to England and to European ideas or part of that part of that early work was about tearing them not tearing them down but playing with them maybe uh, well one one tended to be uh, at that age you are iconoclastic and mm. in fact I I trust I'm not entirely conventional but you do get quieter a bit as you get older <laughs> but yes the whole idea was let's you know let's kick the powers that be let's mm. you know stick it up and you know Tell them where to get off. Yeah. It was that sort of thing. Do you think that there was a, you know, we're coming out of a, a period of, in, of intense censorship in Australia as well? And oh, it was. In, you know, in, in a way that I think we've, certainly I, I don't think my generation comprehends the idea that something could be, oh, someone no. could be sent to jail for a painting or a work of art well, or a swearing stage. Oh, no. Or, no, no, it was quite extraordinary. I mean, Boys in the Band, uh, the American play, mm -hmm. was an extraordinary event, and I think in Melbourne, uh, the cast, the entire cast, were arrested. I think they were, yeah. yeah. But that, that was Harry Miller, who was a very cunning operator. I'm sure he phoned the police. Yeah, he, so. <laughs> he, got, he got a friend, or some, some friend who could play an outraged mother of six, to ring up uh, the cops and say, this is a disgusting play. What would she be doing at the play? I don't know. Yeah. But uh, he, was a, he was a shrewd operator. Mm. You know, he used to put house full when there was no one there at all. And people would come up and say, it was a terrible so we've got a full house. Well, the next night he would have a full house. <laughs> Uh, he was a real salesman. Yeah. And so I suppose riffing on that idea of kind of uh, taking on the sacred, talk, can you talk about how the Christian brothers began? Uh, yes, you? well, uh, before I wrote the Christian brothers, I wrote a play called President Wilson in Paris. One was very aware that little stage over there was a small stage and you couldn't really have more than uh, three or four at the most. Uh, since John came from the same background as I did, which is to say Irish Catholicism, mm. although he's a country boy and I was from the suburbs of Sydney. Uh, we used to talk about uh, the mad uh, Catholic teaching orders that we went through. He went through the Maris brothers and I went through the Irish Christian brothers. But the, of course they were Australian by now. They, the Irish no longer taught the Christian brothers. They were Australians. And the same with the Maris brothers, which was initially a French order. Uh, but I went to the Morris Brothers in Cogra for a year. Um, hell, it was a year of hell actually, uh, as a little boy. And then I went to the Christian Brothers over at Lewisham, uh, which was far more civilised. It's curious, the Second World War's shadow was very long over the Morris Brothers at Cogra. Um, there were military bands. You went into school marching to the music of a military band um, because the war hadn't long ended. And the, whole thing of military glory was in the air. Christian Brothers, um, and although the Irish had fought in the Second World War and the Irish Australians, plenty of them certainly did, um, we went into school uh, with, a, with a bell, you know, just an electric bell and we just walked into, in, <laughs> took our place in class, not uh, marching, yeah. you know, uh, or easing left or whatever bands, <laughs> um, uh, military soldiers seem to have to do. We just walked in and sat down. Mm. But um, so John and I would talk about uh, the experience of growing up uh, Catholic and being educated in the Catholic system. We were both moving away from it. Uh, at university, we, there were, we, our last, the last shreds were still there. After rehearsal, sometimes we'd, we'd go to uh, St. Mary's on Sundays after rehearsals, we might go there for mass. 
Um, also, we had uh, one of our friends who was important in the, in the group, a man called Brian Tapley, a very inspirational uh, guy. He, he became a convert to Catholicism, so we all didn't mind going to Mass, mm. you know, together. But by the time of, that was 1964 or so, by 1970, we weren't terribly interested in going to Mass. Uh, the past. Uh, and so we're talking about this education we had, and I remember thinking there's got to be a play in it. Mm. Um, and I thought, with the stables, it'd be a great thing to do with one man as the brother, and uh, maybe a couple of kids being the school. And then I thought, the trouble is if you've got a school, you've got a couple of kids, you've got the problem of moving them around mm. and, and uh, you've got sideline problems in that little theatre, you know, you've got some kid there and he's sitting, he's sitting of course, mm. in class, he can't move around so much. And I thought, well, why not just have a chair? Mm. I didn't realise the power that, ch that that chair would take, yeah. uh, but, or would have. But uh, anyway, I wrote it fairly fast. One, working under those circumstances, you write very, and as I was only you know, 25 to 30, you're working, I used to get up at five in the morning uh, and write at the table. And then I had a chap, nice chap downstairs, beg me, could I stop typing at five in the morning? <laughs> uh, he was a chap who also worked helping Richard Ware at, uh, when we were restoring the, the stables. And uh, so uh, by eight o'clock I'd finished, shower and get dressed and go to work. Uh, at down William Street. I lived in Elizabeth Bay at that stage. So how far out from the eventual production did you start writing? Oh, well, in, with, with Biggles and uh, um, Hammer on Ice, the scenes were arriving and the actors were rehearsing them. It was like a review. Yeah. With President Wilson, it sort of blurted out of me. John said, you know, have you got an idea? And I put this idea, he said, sounds good, sounds good. And I had nothing, no one had anything. Yeah. So I just sat, sat there and I wrote it. And uh, it's, a, it's about a folly ardeur. It's, it's not a deep play. The actors have to bring a lot to it. Uh, um, but it's, uh, it's, it curiously relates to a psychological pressures I was having at the time. In, in terms of um, my private life. So I, it just came out of me. And yeah. I realised later it was like a sort of Rorschach test, actually. Right. Yeah, I read it today, I said, oh, oh you know. But uh, with the Christian Brothers, again, it was written reasonably quickly, a couple of drafts. I first sat down as a, to write it as an act of revenge. <laughs> uh, on the bastards I hated, and as a tribute to some of the guys I liked a lot, who mm. taught us. And, and I wanted to make it, um, I wanted to make him a normal fellow. I didn't want to make him a pedophile. Mm. Uh, and I was working at the ABC with an actor called Don Crosby, who was on a contract at the, AB, at the ABC radio drama. He'd worked his life in radio drama. That was the only way actors could uh, feed themselves, really. Uh, a couple of quid you could be over at the Independent. If you're a leading actor, you could be paid a pound or two a week doing a few shows. But otherwise, the only way to earn anything like a living wage mm. was to work radio and all those radio serials in the 50s. And some of the people who worked in radio did very well. And they used to have chauffeured limousines take them from one studio to the other. Oh. Uh, it was a bit like a version of television stars, mm. the top ones. They would work all for the commercial uh, radio stations. Mm. But the, um, so Don had lived his life in that. It was quite hair raising for him because he had a few, quite a few kids uh, and they knew the, the rough side of uh, poverty, mm. uh, Don and his wife, Betty. And he, he was a great guy. He became a, a head of actors equity. And, um, anyway, I, I, his son became a Christian brother. <laughs> uh, and so we used, in the production on the stage, we used 
his son Satan <laughs> for the first production. But I'd asked, I'd actually talked to Don about it. Mm. I said, um, you know, I'm writing this play, and I thought he'd be, because he'd been in, he'd been in Don's Don's party. Right. I'm sorry, he'd been in the Removalists. He played the copper. Right. Okay. He played the the old copper in the Removalists, and. I suddenly saw the power this guy had mm. as an actor. He played on, on year, he'd been playing Englishman on radio here, pretending to be Englishman. Uh, and suddenly this raw power came out of this guy because he was playing an Australian. Yeah. And he's playing an Australian, he knew, we all knew, the sort of copper who was a brute, but had never been caught mm. ever beating anyone up. Uh, and he was sensational. Yeah. I thought, well, this guy's been here all his life and no one's ever seen it, how good he was. Mm. So I, I really was thought in my ignorance, well, I'll tell you why I was ignorant, because that Don would be a marvellous Christian brother. Uh, but when I gave it to John to read and he responded immediately and said, this is terrific and we'll put it on. It was only a one act play, so it was thought then not long enough for an evening. Right. We'll wait till something else comes along. And I thought, oh, you know, oh, well, that's the last I'll see of that. <laughs> see. Not, not that he, I thought he lied, it's just that no, yeah. plays can hang around and get dog eared and people forget them and then they're no longer fresh. The theatre always hungers fresh meat, you know. Uh, so. The truth was that Don had terrible problems remembering his lines. A life in radio where you just have your script in your hand, it's a, it's yeah. a, your brain it's is not, not drilled to, to learn. In fact, all, most old actors, I'd say with the exception of John Bell, <laughs> have trouble remembering their lines. Some perhaps less so than others. But uh, Don couldn't remember his lines and that was uh, a requisite for a one-man play. Yeah. And uh, we'd, uh, Peter Carroll had, uh, had done, uh, I'd been on stage with Peter at, at Sydney University and he'd gone off to England for training mm. and he'd come back and he'd done a, some wonderful work with John. He, was in, he played uh, Benedict in uh, Much Ado About Nothing and he, he and Anna were sensational. In fact, it was a marvellous production. Although the Italians didn't like it because it was it was done with a sort of a, a Italian fr fr fruit sellers, uh, uh, English, you know. <laughs> uh, they, Italians were a bit resentful, for good reason. They said, well, when you do, when you do Chekhov, you don't do joke Russian accents, <laughs> do you? Why do we have to have Italian joke accents? But it worked. Um, and Peter was sensational. He was a young, strapping young guy mm. with a full red beard and red hair. And uh, anyway, of course, he, he cut his beard off and he put grey through his hair. And he was far too young playing the Christian brother, but he was fantastic. And I call it the Christian brothers, actually, because mm. it's about the brothers dead, the brothers living, all of them, uh, all of them referred to. Mm. And uh, Peter, uh, I went to see the first, when it was done, because John found a, a partner play with it. Peter Canard wrote a play called Mates about um, uh, cross dressers uh, in a club. Uh, uh, and uh, it was very entertaining actually. Um, and they put that on as a, a double bill called Mates and Brothers at the new Nimrod uh, Theatre, oh. which was, of course, Belvoir Street today. And um, it worked very well, uh, but I was sad for Don, and so when I did it on radio, I asked Don if he could do it on radio, and he did it, but he was weakened by several things. He'd been in the Second World War and was a fighter pilot, a fighter, a gunner, he was a gunner, and he did tell me one day I sat down, because that generation didn't talk much about it. No, I imagine not. So I asked him about being a gunner and he said uh, that every time they went up, uh, all the planes, his and maybe one other would come back. 
And of course they'd come back and he said, the trouble was when you're up there, uh, you'd have to lean on, on the gun because your hands were so cold, they were frozen. You're also aware that you, uh, the other side is firing at you. You're going to go up in flames, literally, in a minute and have petrol under you, burst into flames, and then you're going to plunge into the ground. So every time he went up, it was, this is it. And then when he came down alive, they would run out, fling open the cockpit, drag him out and the and pilot, drag him over to the shed uh, on, the, on the tarmac, and then just fill him full of whiskey, bring him back to life, because he'd just be frozen, just frozen. And I remember Don saying to me one day, well, today's my birthday, mate. I said, that's terrific, Don. How old are you? He said, 50. I nearly died because the guy, he looked like 75. <laughs> and I'm 75. He looked, <laughs> he looked a lot older than I, than I do today because he'd been through this ordeal mm. called the Second World War. And do you think that your audience for the Christian brothers, because they had such a shared... I mean, my father still speaks about the... the yeah, seeing that play and feeling like someone was talking about something that it was still difficult to do or, you know, d d did you feel like because there was that such a kind of common sense of experience that the play landed the way it did? Well, it was a complete surprise. I can tell you this. I, I thought, I, well, John likes it. <laughs> uh, I, I, we thought we, we'd, a few others who have been to the Brothers might get to see it. We just thought, you know, we were astonished at the reaction. And what happened was, all those, shall I say, Irish Catholics, all those people who had been to the brothers' schools, that included by now, of course, Italians, Greeks, mm. uh, we had uh, cross-section um, Maltese, all the people who had been to Catholic schools were now in the professions uh, and had an interest in theatre. And even those who didn't have an interest in theatre got to hear about it. And we started to have buses turn up wow. and, and pour out of the buses. Buses came from Wollongong, came in to the theatre, came down from Newcastle. And Peter, the play was so popular that he'd do two shows a night. Uh, he'd do a seven o'clock and then he'd do a nine o'clock. Wow. And the, the, uh, that was, this was when the play came back. It was, had its first season with mates. And then to poor old Peter Canard's chagrin, they dropped mates <laughs> and just did my play. Uh, but um, they, uh, then the audience, by the nine o'clock audience would have had a few drinks. And so when the hymns would start or any kind of, everyone would start singing. Yeah. Wow. It was a sort of communal, and Peter would have to control that audience because it would get out of hand. Yeah. So he'd have to, and when he'd pull out the strap and hit the, hit the chair and stuff, ah, oh, the audience would go wild. It was a mystic, <laughs> an extraordinary experience. It'll never, It'll never have that reaction again because it just hit mm. that audience at that time. Uh, today, they, they, I, I, they probably aren't allowed to hit people <laughs> in school anymore, the strap, but all that stuff was just a collision mm. of the, the generations. And, uh, and we were as astonished as anyone. Uh, and the theatre was certainly very delighted because up to that point, they'd had a bit of a hard time getting new audiences uh, to uh, the new Belvoir. Mm. It had a couple of tepid sort of shows. It opened not well uh, with, I think, a version of the Oresteia or something like that. And then it was just... And this, this play, certainly the Much Ado, but the new plays hadn't taken hold, I think. Um, I'd been away in England for a couple of years. Uh, so, uh, but when I came back, they, he put it on then. Yeah. I think I wrote it in maybe 75 and he put it on in 77, I, or, or perhaps before that. My, uh, my, mm. The date's a bit rubbery, I forget now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and was that, what was the last work you wrote for Nimrod? Well, after that, uh, I never wrote any more plays specifically for Nimrod. Mm. Uh, as a result of the Christian Brothers, it gave me work for the rest of my life, one way or another. Mm. Uh, 
I was a one-trick pony. <laughs> and uh, so what happened was uh, a man called Colin George, who was an Englishman out here working with the South, he's actually working up in Armadale, in the drama department in Armadale. He, uh, he'd seen the Christian Brothers, or read it, I forget which, and he commissioned a, a, a short play from me, which I wrote, and it was done there. And then he went to South Australia to, uh, to run the South Australian Theatre Company, which had been run before that by John Tasker and Rodney Fisher and George Ogilvy. Mm. And these were the Don Dunson years. I, I came into when I went down there. And he said, would you come down and be my assistant? So I'd been in uh, radio drama for years. 10 years I was finding it a bit of a trial. I want to do something else, you know. Uh, I was in my 30s and just wanting to get into the theatre. Uh, more than just writing. Mm. I thought I'd, I'd directed actors in radio. There's a big difference actually, as I found out. <laughs> radio, you work with th people for two hours or three hours, yeah. uh, two or three days, and that's it. Theatre, yeah. you're, you're there <laughs> for a stuck. month. <laughs> and, uh, and I found it actually didn't suit me at all. Right. But I went down there and I, I, I learnt vast amounts. And Colin commissioned play after play. Yeah. Uh, and I did a, I did a to play about the domestic life of Karl Marx, uh, and uh, it was done over at the stables but later yeah. when Peter Kingston was running uh, the Griffin. Peter, Peter Kingston did a production of it. Just wrapping up, I suppose, really. It seems to me that Nimrod was a, a coming together of so many different things that maybe mean that it, can't, it couldn't really happen again in, sort of, in terms of... Well, it came out of, sort of, came out of nothing. Today, yeah. Thank God we at least have mulch to grow new things out of. Yeah. There wasn't even mulch, not even <laughs> leaves there, except the doll. The doll and the one day of the year were yeah. the two plays. But there was like classic Australian scenery, two, two trees on a dead plain. Yeah. Uh, and there's there nothing else yeah. to, to grow sh anything. And uh, it, in Adelaide, I wrote a play about owning a boarding house. And that was called Last Day in Woolloomooloo. And Colin again commissioned that. Uh, it, it was my version of the lower depths, right. but I didn't want to go into the Marxist thing of, you know, a revolution at the end of it. I did examine again the business of capitalism, mm. but I wanted to get away from a cliched ending of, uh, uh, you know, solving the problems of the world through, right. through politics. Yeah. I, so I moved it into another sphere. Uh, which I, I don't think John cared for because it, it was a spiritual sphere, really, uh, uh, re with reincarnation, elements of reincarnation, which I treated uh, humorously, uh, in fact, somewhat farcically. One stage, uh, a man is brought to life. Earlier in the play, a cat is brought to life. You know, it was, it was theatrical. Mm. And uh, I wanted John to do it, of course, at Nimrod. That was the play I mentioned about Chris Westwood not yeah. wanting to do. Um, and uh, the, the, the actual building is around the corner here, the building uh, that I owned, uh, that had been a pub. The poet Christopher Brennan lived in it. His father was the publican. Uh, it was called the Glen Hotel uh, in, in um, Paddington, uh, uh, Darlinghurst Paddington. And um, so that play was the last play I wrote. Yeah, right. Uh, and, uh, one always has affection for plays that one uh, aren't done very much, and my, that's my natural affection is to that play. It requires a few actors, mm. but John wasn't terribly warm about it. He was dutiful, and then I said, "Look, come over and hear the audience. Come over and hear the laughs." So he did fly over and he saw it. Of course, the houses in Adelaide and Collins' production uh, was terrific. Was, and John did a very good production mm. uh, here, but he could, he f you could see him thinking this is a bit of sleight of hand, uh, that I'd, I was dodging the main question right. about capitalism, you know, that I was shirking the whole business of, of landlord and tenant. Mm. But I didn't want to go for some kind of uh, gawky answer, you know, 
with workers together and looking for yeah. the new day and you know all that sort of stuff. It's been done. Gorky did it wonderfully. Yeah, that's more complicated than yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. And did you consciously not write? Well, I just had no. Way? I did write a couple of plays yeah. because people said, "Oh, you must write again. You must write." And I wrote, and uh, I remember, in fact, I gave them to John and Anna to read. Anna gave it to me back and said, "Thank you, Ronnie." John was more tactful <laughs> and said, uh, you know, said something nice and asked me a bit about it, but obviously it was a dog, that's all. And I thought, well, I'm done. 